All right, so before we go into the uh, neural gas technique, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the uh, k-means that I uh, didn't on the other video. One is that uh, k-means uh, is sensitive to outliers. Uh, and that's because the mean is sensitive to outliers, right? Uh, if you have a data point that's far away from your other data points, uh, the centroid is going to move a lot towards that data point. Uh, so that can be bad if you've got some a few bad data points perhaps in your data. Um, so what would you do in that case? Uh, there's a method of course called uh, with the obvious name there, k-medians. So instead of taking the mean uh, of your data at each stage, you would take the median at, the, yeah, at each stage. So that might work a little bit better in those cases. Uh, similarly, is there a way to grow the number of clusters so that you don't have to uh, specify k? And there is. Um, the idea is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, at each stage, keep track. At each iteration, I should say. Or every once in a while, uh, compute. The distortion error, you're probably doing that anyway on each cell. Uh, if the dist uh, distortion error is too large, or I guess you could say, uh, you know, if the, yeah, if the biggest distortion error is too big, uh, what you can do is you can split or add a cluster, cluster center, to the cluster with the most data or with the most distortion error. Uh, now there's two ways to do that, right? Uh, one way to do that is to take two random data points, take two random points from that cluster to initialize it. Another way to do that is to just take your, uh, whoops, sorry about that, uh, take CI, your ith cluster, and split it into two, CI1 and CI2, and make that uh, CI, these are vectors by the way, uh, plus or minus some epsilon. Uh, so that would be another technique, because supposedly, right, your center is in the middle, so splitting it just a little bit on either side should uh, not result in uh, empty clusters, but it could. Uh, so you do have to watch for empty clusters. But of course that's going to be, that could be a problem in most algorithms, watch for empty clusters. Good, okay, so um, that is the uh, k-means uh algorithm. Now when does uh, k-means work well and when doesn't it? Uh, k-means works well as kind of a first approximation. The problem is, is um, you know, when we were working with uh, clustering techniques back in the day, we were trying to find a way of embedding the centers into our manifold, what's called the manifold. It's locally, a manifold is something that locally looks like Rn. Um, and so uh, what would happen kind of as a problem, is suppose you have a circle. Uh, where's the centroid? Right in the middle. And so what's the problem here is that the center doesn't look like any of the data points. Right, and so that's a that's a big issue. Uh, you don't want the, uh, in this case, uh, we didn't want our data points or our centers to be away from the data. We want our centers to be buried in the data somehow. Okay, and so uh, that led us into considering neural gas, the neural gas algorithm. Okay, and so um, how does the neural gas algorithm work? Uh, well, suppose you've got some data points here, and suppose you've got a couple of centers, uh, let's see, maybe pink. 
Okay, and so the idea behind the uh, neural gas algorithm is that uh, suppose that uh, we choose, so you're going to choose data points at random, not centers, but data points at random. And so suppose that you choose this data point right here. Let me switch colors. I choose this data point X. Well, the idea is, is that um, I'm going to take a look at the cluster centers and the cluster center that is closest, I'm going to put, I'm going to try to attract it to this data point more than this center. So this one's far away. It's still going to move towards my X, but not as much. Okay, and so notice that the direction of travel here is going to be X minus uh, C, K, you know, for each of the uh, centers. Good. And so, uh, again, what we want to do is we're going to take an X. We're going to uh, take the distance to each center. We're going to sort those, sort the distances. And we're going to let the closest win, uh, closest center be the winner. Okay. And so the winner is going to be updated the most, and then the other ones are going to be updated uh, kind of according to some algorithm that we're going to discuss. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to do is I want to order uh, the centers according to the distance. So now we're going to sort the cluster centers by their distance. And when I say that, I mean uh, keep track of the indices. You don't need the vectors themselves, right? Okay, and so I might have uh, I1 might be the closest to I uh, CI, or I'm sorry, uh, to the data point X. And then I2 might be the next closest to X, and I3 is the next closest to X, and so on. And we're going to take the K closest. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to re we're going to build a vector. This is going to be 0, 1, 2, up to, what is it going to be, K minus 1. Okay, and these are the numbers uh, in the vector called S that's going to be used in the notes uh, to do our update. Now remember, the 0 corresponds to center I1, 1 corresponds to center I2, 2 corresponds to center I3, and so on. And so in the notes, these are called uh, SI, okay, for the data point X. Good. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and, uh, maybe I should just go ahead and write down the update rule. Okay, so the generic update rule that we're going to use is that the new cluster center is going to be the old cluster center plus some function of t, and then we're going to move it in the direction of x minus c, right? So just as a reminder, uh, what did that look like on our picture? Right, you're starting here and you're moving towards uh, the vector x. Good. And so this h of t is modified by how close uh, C is to X. Okay, so if C is very close to X, then H of T will be large, and if C is far away from X, it's going to be small. Good, okay. Um, and so the actual algorithm will look like the following. The actual update rule. It's going to be uh, C, let's see, uh, I'm trying to follow my notes, but I shouldn't have uh, written it that way. C, I, K, remember the I, K is the uh, sorted centers here, okay, so they're not in order is kind of the issue with that. Uh, C, I, K plus epsilon times an exponential function with minus uh, S, I, K divided by lambda, and this is going to be your h of t here, times x minus c i k. Okay, so now um, what is our 
uh, epsilon going to do in our function. This is called the learning rate. And the idea behind that is it's going to start large and then over time go to zero. Okay, and similarly uh, lambda is going to be the same idea here. Lambda starts large, uh, goes to zero. And then the, our SAIK here, remember those are integers that tell us how close center CI is, or how much, how many centers are closer to C, to the X value than the current value is, the current center is, right? So the winner has a zero there, and the farthest away uh, vector has a K minus one there, okay? That's this value right here. In the, I guess you can't see where I'm pointing. Okay. Um, so what does that exponential function look like? Just a quick draw here. So suppose that uh, we'll, we'll keep s fixed, maybe at 1, and then we'll, or at t, this is going to be s, I k down here, and then lambda is going to change. So suppose that, uh, for example, lambda equals 1, then this is going to be a decreasing exponential curve, right? going to go to zero. Whoops, don't want to go to zero too fast. Okay, let me draw that up here. That's lambda equals one. And then what happens if lambda is like 10? If lambda is like 10, what's going to happen is that the force is going to be a lot broader. In fact, if it's 10, it's going to be really big. It's not going to decrease as fast, right? On this side. Ah, okay. So this is lambda equals 10, lambda equals 1, and then it'll, uh, it, it changes position right in the curve, so it's going to come out like that. Good. And so, uh, maybe I should have drawn that in a different color, huh? Let's see if I can draw that. Oop. Ah. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have tried that. Okay, I'm starting to ramble. Uh-oh, that's a bad sign. Uh, okay. Do red for the last one. Turn it. Okay, so for uh, lambda equals a small value like one tenth, right? That's going to come down like that. Okay, and so what we want to think about this as is, uh, you know, for uh, s i k to be between like zero, one, uh, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Uh, what's going to happen is that the influence of the exponential function is going to drop off significantly, right, with the value of lambda. So if lambda is really small, really, really small, what's going to end up happening is you're only going to be updating really like one or two centers. And when lambda is big, you're going to be updating all of the centers quite a bit. Okay, does that make sense? Oh boy, I'm already at 13 minutes. Um, I, I did start rambling. Okay, so in the next uh, in the next video, we're gonna actually uh, write down what the algorithm is. We'll see you then.